Welcome everyone, good morning. This is Marcia Windrus. I am Marcia Windrus, the head of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I just celebrated my two months anniversary here and I'm very excited. Happy Friday, happy Black History Month. Before we get started, we have a quick video to share where we ask our colleagues across the long hallway what does Black History Month means to you? So let's watch. So Aaron, let's go. We learned very little about Black history. If that happened in my childhood, and can you imagine most students are not learning about Black history? To acknowledge, celebrate, look at the accomplishments. Paying tribute to people like me, stories that are and still part of my life. A time for us to really reflect on what has been and what we can do moving forward. It's an opportunity to learn more. To celebrate the achievement Black Americans have contributed to society. To focus on the people that have given me and so many others a chance to rise. Thank you everyone for sharing and helping us to start Black History Month with both celebration and reflection. When we had our first town hall of 2021, we were still reeling from the horrifying insurrection in our nation's capital. We discussed how that show of racism and attack on this nation's democracy was a clear example of what we committed to fighting against all last year and moving forward. It's a painful reminder that there's so much work left to do and we must work to heal while moving forward together. We are better together. Through our actions in support of Black Lives Matter, continuing our education in anti-racism and work in health equity and cross collaboration between our BRGs, we remain dedicated to fighting for truth, science, diversity, equity, and inclusion within W2O walls and in our communities. Each of us here at W2O have a part of the movement, are a part of the, mo the movement for change in racial justice, just as we're a part of the movement for recovery from this pandemic. They go hand in hand. We want to continue this conversation by dedicating today to action and to kickstart our celebration of Black History Month in the US. We have some experts with us today to discuss racial disparities in healthcare, an area that W2O has already made commitments to through our DEI client engagement practice. We're eager to learn more and identify areas where we can support and innovate here by utilizing the best of W2O's abilities. I'll now pass it over to our very own W2O, Mary Seidman, to moderate our discussion and introduce our guests. Mary. Thank you, Marcia, and thank you and to you and Wendy for all the hard work you um, put into putting this together. We are very, very lucky to have three amazing experts today. I'm going to give a quick intro of each. If I went through everything that all of them had done, we would run the time out. Um, but we've got Dr. Jessica Isom, we've got Mary Stutz and Dr. Reed Tuxen, and we're extremely lucky to have them. Dr. Isom is an experienced board certified community psychiatrist, public speaker, medical educator, and a consultant for diversity, equity, and inclusion and anti-racism projects with her own consulting team and a growing team of anti-racism coaches and organizational trainers. Over the past 10 years, she's drawn on her psychiatric training from UNC and Yale to connect across differences in power, education, and perspective to foster a collaborative approach to achieving racial justice and equity. Dr. Isom is currently an attending psychiatrist at Codman Square Health at Boston which is a federally qualified health center meant to meet the needs of underserved areas or populations, where she provides expertise on, uh, expertise on anti-racist transformation of staff and programming with a specific focus on the opioid use disorder services. Jessica is also, uh, fortunately for us, one of our key online influencer 
advisory board members. And she's been extremely active um, across all types of social media with her anti-racism efforts. So you might see her on Twitter, you might see her on Facebook, or you might see her on Clubhouse. Mary Stutz, um, a lot of you may be familiar with Mary because she's helped us with many projects before and is a member of our CEO Advisory Council. She's provided global leadership in biotech, healthcare, technology, and media industries at Fortune 200 companies such as Genentech, Bayer, BMS, Kaiser, and Comcast NBCU, as well as United Health Group. She leads uh, both inclusive leadership and emerging workforce career development workshops for corporations that seek top level as well as frontline grassroots solutions for cultivating inclusive cultures. Her passion for supporting, nurturing and developing youth and professionals aspiring to leadership positions has led her to found the Excellent Life Center, which focuses on developing underrepresented youth and women aspiring to leadership positions. And finally, we have Dr. Reed Tuxin, who's worked for over 35 years as a health professional, engaging in nearly every sector of health and medical care, from serving as the Commissioner of Public Health for DC, the SVP for programs at the March of Dimes, President of the Charles Drew University of Medicine and Science, um, setting the professional standards of the AMA, and working as Chief of Medical Affairs for United Health Group. And he's currently the managing partner of Tuxin Health Connections. Dr. Tuxin is also the founder of the Black Coalition Against COVID-19, which is an organization that was created to organize DC's inclusive cohort of community leaders and act advocates to mobilize and coordinate all the available community assets in support of the efforts and especially government efforts and especially those of DC Health. And we've been partnering with this group on communication activities on the road to vaccine confidence. So the focus of today's roundtable is really to talk about a multi-dimensional perspective on racial health disparities, but with a focus on what it takes for healthcare institutions to become anti-racist. So what actions are really necessary to eradicate them in the future? We're so fortunate to have people with community, academic, industry and government experience. So this is really a, a treat for us and, and we will get such a broad um, look at all the different ways that we can be doing things in healthcare industry. So we are going to discuss the past and move to the present and to understand how these disparities develop and really talk about what is happening now in the time of COVID, which is something that's brought all of this to light so that it can't be ignored anymore. And we're also gonna spend some time thinking about what new approaches we need to take in the future from medical education to interpersonal interactions in the clinic and to in institutional and systemic practices. What do we need to do? So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I think, Dr. Isom, what do you think are the key drivers of racial health care disparities today? And how does that matter in terms of what's happened in the past? Why do we care about Black history and medicine? It's a great question. And thank you for such a kind introduction. I, I have two answers to that. Um, and the first part is how we define the problem. Um, there's often a problem definition issue, uh, which uh, of course is related to how we define the solution. Um, so if we look at history, we would understand that we've essentially constructed in this country health promoting environments and health limiting environments. And when we talk about social determinants of health, we think about where people live, grow, work and play. And we've invested resources in some communities and not others. Um, so a lot of people are set up to fail for that reason. But in addition to that, when we see the disparities, we also see uh, people within health institutions struggle with what those disparities um, originate from. Um, so if they don't think about the history, if they don't think about structural racism, if they don't think about how that permeates our social, political, and economic opportunities to support our well-being, they might instead offer uh, racist explanations like there's something that these people are doing or not doing and that's contributing to their health conditions as is. If they properly define the problem, if they thought about societal norms, if they thought about policies and economic and empowerment and things of that nature, then we'd shift our attention to thinking about the supports that we could put into place to actually close the gap on those disparities. When you do have the proper definition, you come up with solutions like some of the work that we are all doing on the panel that really focus on putting things in place to support uh, closing the gap in a very um, historically informed way. Thank you. Mary, you were a groundbreaker at Stanford um, with your DEI efforts. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and what um, Dr. Isom has been talking about defining the problem? Sure. So um, it's interesting that 
even though Stanford is a great um, academic institution, it was uh, it is a very insular organization, as are a lot of the academic institutions. So um, getting them to move beyond just their own knowledge and expertise and, and phenomenal wisdom to understand you actually probably want to start with talking to people, talking to the community, uh, talking to the, the people who are actually underrepresented and not experiencing this same level of equality. Um, and so that has, was the biggest challenge for me from a diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective was helping to help folks get out of their own uh, processes and out of their own way. So for example, uh, we wanted to do a partnership in a, one of the um, communities of color around diversifying the uh, human genome database. And so we reached out to a great organization, Roots, in, in Oakland. And as we were talking to them, one of the things I coached them say is, okay, before we get all the way into what we need from them, because that's what we heard a lot from the community is that, yeah, you come to the community when you need us for a clinical trial or something like that, but then we never hear back from you. Uh, we never even hear the results until you show up for the next thing you need. So it was very important to say, okay, we're interested in something, but what do you need? What's the priority for you? So this was last year around the March timeframe, just as COVID was hitting up, starting up and um, they were, uh, that organization just serves so many of the inner city population. And they said, you know, we would love to be able to provide testing. And so we were able to go back to the organization and say, look, we need to set up something for that. And, and folks were happy to help. And so they said, yes, we're going to set up a drive-through uh, testing clinic around by, you know, by then it was like into April, May, and we're going to set this up. And and their folks can come. And so we go back to Roots and we're telling them, hey, we're gonna do this drive-through clinic and your folks can come. And we were wondering why they weren't just smiling and so happy. And they said, well, the majority of our folks don't have cars. It's like, right. oh snap, wait, hold up. We were just totally, but if we hadn't been there talking to them, fortunately we caught it early enough because we were talking to them okay. and listening to them. And, uh, and so then we had to add the tents with the walk-up. Uh, testing sites uh, at that particular site. We didn't do that at any other sites in the Bay Area, uh, but we did it at that site in uh, Emeryville, which is really like the border of, of, of Oakland. So that's just one example. Thank you, and, Dr. Uh, Tuxen. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, let me um, also uh, just sort of, I uh, appreciate Mary's points, but also uh, coming back to Dr. Eisen's point, I think when people think about Black history, there is a uh, a misunderstanding or a lack of clarity about what it really means for the, per the current moment. And so let me just very quickly take you through something that will hopefully help. Remember that black people came to this country 400 years ago, and that began 250 years of enslavement. During those 250 years when we were enslaved, 10 to 15 generations of white people grew wealth and owned land. 150 years ago, we were so-called free. That was then the, um, the immersion into Jim Crow uh, laws, which kept us enslaved, that, were, that suppressed our vote, and we had no ownership ability of wealth. During that time, also white Americans erected monuments to slavers. 125 years ago, J. Marion Sims, the father of OBGYN, had a statue erected, made his work on unanesthetized slaves. That's how he created his science. Meanwhile, during that 125 years, another five to 10 more generations of whites prospered. 90 years ago was the infamous Tuskegee experience. 60 years ago, uh, my parents were finally legally able to vote. Legal to vote just 60 years ago, we were so-called freed from discrimination, yet consigned to segregated schools, neighbors, neighborhoods and denial of bank loans. Meanwhile, several more generations of white people prospered. And so we are saying and helping to understand that when we talk about the social disparities in health, the reason that we are in a place of poor housing, of, of lack of, of suboptimal education, uh, the, the, uh, the absence of, of quality food, all of which contribute to health, this wasn't just something that happened. It is not just we do, were delivered into this historical moment. This has been a long term. And then it's almost as if in the society today, 
there's a sense that, well, there must be something wrong with black people that they find themselves in this position, but never equating or understanding the journey of how we were kept down so long while the rest of America was allowed to prosper. And all of a sudden people wanna blame the victim for their victimization. So I just wanna make that point. Black History Month needs not to be just this sterile celebration, although important of, our, of the people who have prevailed despite such odds. It also needs to be understood how come we are where we are and it is not the fault of somehow lazy, unintellectual mm -hmm. people who couldn't pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And I, I do want to make an aside comment to people. When you think about your communities and what you can do at home, and one of the things that we've been talking about um, in one of the anti-racism physician groups where I met Dr. Isom, go to your schools and ask them what they are teaching for American history. Go to your schools, look at the curriculum. What are they teaching your kids? Are they teaching them the same stuff that we learned and then, or at least I learned in the 1970s? Because all of that is not true. So if you think about something you can do in your community, that is something you can do. Go to your schools and find out what they're teaching because the true American history is not frankly what we were taught as children. And so Dr. Tuxin, you know, one of the things you mentioned was um, the OBGYN. I just want to give some people context if they haven't heard about this. There is an OBGYN who's considered the father of modern um, gynecology. And the way he derived all of his work was by operating on unanesthetized blades. And he's been um, lauded over the years. And it's only in the past few years that people have really come forward to say that um, this is totally inappropriate to be um, praising this person, but also in light of all of the maternal information we have on black women and how we are failing black women and black um, children in the OB field. This is a, a very interesting topic that people should really read about. It really tells you a lot about medicine. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Tuxin. That was extremely helpful. Dr. Isom, you see patients um, on, on a weekly basis. And uh, Dr. Tuxin mentioned, you know, the, the mentality of blaming the patient for sort of the conditions that have been inflicted by our systemic racism. How do you see that in your daily practice in, in psychiatry? Um, because I also you know, was in the Boston area. We think of it as a very segregated healthcare system. I do want the audience to know that about 10% of the hospitals in the country treat 50% of the pa black patients in the country. That's segregated medicine. Um, so Dr. Eisen, if you could speak a little bit about that and what you see in your practice so people can really understand what it feels like to go to the doctor and not feel comfortable. Yeah, I mean, I'll add another point to that statistic that you just gave that um, teaching hospitals were strategically placed in areas, uh, urban areas um, that per predominantly populated by black and brown people. And what that means is that you have trainees, medical students and residents working in these teaching hospitals with patients who often don't have access to other institutions. Um, so there's also a, a cultural understanding that these patients have that they're gonna have lots of turnover for that reason. So every year they're gonna have new doctors and that essentially disrupts any kind of continuity. And what does it mean that we're teaching doctors, nurses, pharmacists how to become a professional by disproportionately exposing them to black and brown uh, patients? That's another historical thing to understand. Um, when I meet patients, I have to account for the history. And fortunately for me, I, I took time and a lot of self-directed reading and learning to understand what history is coming into the room with me and my patients. So I know I have to engage in trustworthiness building um, as a psychiatrist, because although I am a black uh, woman, I'm still a member of the institution and all of that that comes with me into the, the relationship. So I have to build trust with them first. And then everything I offer, everything I suggest has to include some unlearning of how I was taught. Um, so I share power in the room. I don't hoard power. We're gonna come up with something collaboratively together. Um, I don't pressure patients to do things. So if they say, hey doc, I'm not really sure about taking that medication. I know the history. So I say, you know what? I'll give you some more information, take a couple days, think about it, come back and we'll have another conversation. All of that's informed by me having read and, under and, and understood what's happening in the room, what history is in the room and how that affects how they operate today. So I'm, I'm much more patient than I was taught to be. I'm much more uh, collaborative than I was taught to be. Uh, and I keep it real. I give people more information um, because that's a way of accounting for that history. 
Dr. Tuxin, in terms of putting together the Black Coalition against COVID-19, what were the obstacles you faced um, that were either institutional or systemic or interpersonal that you feel like people should focus on when they're trying to put together an organization to do something as a team? Well, it's a great uh, question. And so what we were doing actually with the Black Coalition Against COVID was responding to the challenge um, as we put things together. And so what our coalition involves is the uh, four black uh, medical schools, Howard, Meharry in, uh, uh, in, in Nashville, uh, Morehouse in Atlanta, and Charles Drew University in LA, combined with the National Medical Association and the National Black Nurses Association. So we brought together all of the leading uh, health organizations and institutions in the black community as one coordinated uh, uh, effort. And we wanna really thank W2O for uh, all of the support that you have given us uh, across the board in helping us to get our message out. Because what is important is who are the trusted voices? And this is the key, uh, I think, uh, 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 part of the, of the predicate of your question. It is being able to have, uh, as Dr. Isom has said, uh, and Mary Stutz has said, trust. And so what we now understand, and, and, and as I learned clearly uh, from, I used to go around a lot and give keynote speeches to health institutions, hospital systems, and so forth. And as, as Mary sort of indicated, you go into the, the room where they are planning and they've got magic markers all over the place and these big white poster boards with lots of tape because the poster boards always fall down and, and they always have their strategic plan. Uh, and at the end of the day, at the bottom is go to community. <laughs> and so it's this, this afterthought that always seems to occur. And so what there needs to be in, in summary is a sense of mission and will. What is the mission and will of these organizations as they are trying to move forward? Do they see this as part of mission? Do they have the will? And then very keenly then is being involved in, in the strategic planning process with their constituencies, as Mary has indicated, so that there is a conversation that is ongoing before the strategic plan is finalized, that people are involved. And then a very key point that Dr. Isom makes, and it is exceedingly important, sharing power. Finally, I would use as an example of this kind of conversation is a remarkable conversation for me to observe of the business roundtable a year ago, when they started to look at what are the values of the enterprise and is shareholder value always the number one and only phenomenon to, to, to view. And should we, in fact, have corporations with a certain sense of mission and responsibility start to look at what they do and how it relates to the society in which their institutions exist? And so how do you then connect all of this and align it with your business objectives? And that is, I think, the fundamental work that I, that I think has to occur. And that is the kind of thing that we're trying to do with the Black Coalition Against COVID to bringing that trusted voice a sense of expertise into a holistic conversation in our community. Thank you. I would I also one, add to please. what um, Reed just said. I mean, he's spot on. I've heard him before, he's amazing. And he captures all the amazing points. I would just add that um, we have to try as much as possible also with those trusted voices, identify the people like me voices as well. So we have our leaders, we have our activists, uh, we have all these folks, but at the end of the day, people trust people like them. And so having those folks speak up and, and talk about why they are supporting, and certainly with COVID, I just think it's so critical. And I, I know that one of the questions is gonna be about what can you do as an agency, but capturing that assortment of voices is going to be so critical. Uh, and I'll just give you a quick, quick example. I was just at a gathering of friends and, and we were like virtual gathering of friends. We weren't all together, but um, uh, talking about whether or not it came up, are you gonna get the vaccine? And so I just listened. I didn't wanna force my knowledge on anybody. And so everybody was going back and forth. And I think I did throw in about the efficacy rate or something like that, but I just wanted to let them have that conversation and see where it ended. And um, somebody said, well, we know our pastor's not gonna get it. And his sister-in-law says, no, actually he said he's gonna get it. And there was silence on the phone because this was somebody who he believes in doctors and stuff, but 
yeah, going to get yeah, just, everybody was shocked. And and she said, well, he said he's going to get it, not because he's worried about himself getting sick, but because he wants to protect his family and keep others from getting sick. It was such a powerful statement. And to have people like that talk about it from that perspective. We know Black History Month, the theme this year is the family, uh, resilience and power and diversity. Um, but the uh, talking about things from the perspective of the safety of your whole family and protecting your whole family and having regular people, you know, regular people say that, I think there's a huge opportunity and we can't forget about those voices as well. Thank you. Uh, that that's extreme. And so, you know, looking at diversity at companies, I think is one of the most critical things, but how do we, Mike Huckman had a great question. You met him yesterday. As a company, you're, you're working on yourself internally and you're reaching out to the community. How do you make it less transactional? You know, how do you think about the value you're truly providing? Because clinical trials, yes, you're enrolling more diverse patients, but it's not like you are not making money from that trial, right? It's not like you are not getting something out of these transactions. What are the genuine things that you know healthcare companies can do to make a true relationship over time, rather than that you know Mary you mentioned coming back when you need us, right? Coming back for the next thing. Great question. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I, th I think that, that that this is this is really important. First of all, um, you know, I mean, I think the use of the word transactional is is is, is important and provocative in the sense that, look, you all, you know, you're dealing with people who are trying to run businesses. And so the business needs to be aligned with the purpose and let's always be clear, but the essence of the business requires the infrastructure to work. So I, it is amazing to me that when I was commissioner of health in Washington DC during the height of the HIV epidemic, uh, that was uh, in the 1980s, 40 years ago, the number one rate limiting step in my ability to fight that disease was the Tuskegee syphilis study. It, it was the, the distrust of Tuskegee was a fundamental barrier. Every TV show, every radio show that I went on to try to talk about wearing a condom and safe sex and so forth always devolved to the first question, well, let's talk about Tuskegee. But what is amazing, Mary, and this is really what drives me nuts, is today, every time I go on the radio to talk about COVID, first question, let me talk about Tuskegee. So the point being, every time we try to talk about enrolling people in clinical trials today, first question, Tuskegee, how is it possible that the healthcare enterprise, the entire research apparatus in this country, the entire clinical care delivery system in this country, and the entire health policy enterprise in this country has done absolutely nothing in 40 years to take Tuskegee off the table. So from a business point of view, if you are in the business of doing clinical trials and you are still fighting over Tuskegee today, then it is starting to tell you that your transactional nature, your, the running of your business, the fundamental you know, environmental threat to your success is this issue. And so now I think it starts to turn this around and say to all of us now, you know there will be the next pandemic in a minute. Are we still going to have Tuskegee on the table? And so I'm calling for every single player in the healthcare enterprise, both in clinical research, clinical care delivery, and health policy, we need to all come together in a room and we need to decide now, take this off the table once and for all. I, I, I just have to say, to, oh, go, ahead. go ahead, please. As a community psychiatrist, Tuskegee is on the table every day. I mean, I work with majority Black patients from across the African diaspora, everybody. And Tuskegee is in the room with me every day as I'm trying to do my job. So what you just called for people to do, Dr. Tucker, would allow me to be more effective as a Black psychiatrist working with majority Black patients. Nobody else is working on Tuskegee. We're talking about Tuskegee as Black physicians, nurses, and other professionals, but no one else is con contributing to that effort. So even in daily clinical interactions, it prevents me from being as effective as I could be as a race concordant physician working with Black patients. And I, I would just want to add point to out that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I would just no, add no, to that the work I've done with uh, Stanford and now with UC Davis and other institutions. Um, the, a big part of the problem, why Tuskegee keeps coming up, is because the majority of the faculty and the physicians are white. 
And so we don't have enough um, people of color as physicians, because again, it's a trust factor. And the fact that the numbers of black males becoming physicians is actually declining. Um, women are doing, you're seeing more women of color, but or specifically black women, but um, we're not seeing them becoming the physicians. And then, so first of all, so you don't see the faces. It's, and then the other thing is the biases that show up um, and the dismissive attitudes and the implicit and micro and the microaggressions and all that when when those physicians are interacting with the patients. And so we hear things like, well, the physician didn't even look me in the eye. There's no cultural uh, intelligence that these uh, providers have to be able to help garner that trust. Uh, and then to only time they see you for the most part is when they're trying to you're trying to enroll them for a clinical trial. Um, is also not a good thing. So looking at it holistically across the board, when you talk about taking Tuskegee off the table, we absolutely have to do it, but we have to look at the whole system across the board, not just clinical trials. And, and Mary, let me just add real quick to two points that Mary has just made that are important, I think. Number one, remember, realize that the, the, the statistics she just gave about the number of people who are in medical school and what that demography is. I've been fighting for minorities to be in medical school since 1970. When I started the work, it was about two to 3%. We've had all kinds of programs and all kinds of elements. Do you know what it is today? 5%. Same. Do you exactly. know what the makeup of, of women in medical school today is? More than 50%. How in the heck did that happen? And so I think it is very important. Number two though, and this is what I really wanna push a little bit on as well. When tens of thousands of black people feel compelled to take to their city streets to declare that their lives matter. That is not just a criminal justice issue. That is a healthcare issue. If, if people of color do not believe that their lives actually matter to their society and they have to go out and march to declare their own dignity, then that spills over into every other sector and into healthcare. And my point is this, we in healthcare did not really embrace the Black Lives Matter movement because it, it gets all caught up in <laughs> politics or, yep. or in, instead of the people who are the smartest in our society, who should be able to stand back from Republican, Democrat, who, if people who took Hippocratic oaths, people who are health professionals, could look at a society of people who felt like their lives, their, their very deaths are insignificant to society. If we did not come forward and embrace that and say, wait a minute, we have got to do everything in our power to say to you that in the healthcare arena, your lives absolutely matter. And every person that walks into a clinical arena, that that life is important. If we don't say that, then we are guilty of the same problems that everybody else is doing. To, and, and we failed to do that because I guess we put political posturing over the respect for human life. So I, I wanna um, point out for Dr. Tux in the history, he mentioned Tuskegee. Tuskegee experiment did not end, I believe until the late sixties or seventies. That is incredibly recent. That is not a long time ago. We also talk about Tuskegee as being in the past as if it's an isolated incident that happened and we have to move beyond. These types of systemic racism issues in medicine are happening every day. And I do wanna point out some of the things that are happening now. When we look at precision medicine, which we've all talked about in healthcare, many of the experiments, many of the, the biological samples are taken from people of European descent. That is not helpful information necessarily for people of color. There's a book by um, Ruha Benjamin about how technology um, impacts uh, uh, people with racial, um, uh, racial impact everywhere. It's called Race After Technology, Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Code. And so I think as healthcare industries go into greater science, science and technology tend to perpetuate racial biases rather than help them. And so I think that this is something we really need to think about from our own company's point of view, from our client's point of view. Tuskegee is not the past. We need to do better, but we're not doing better now. We are, um, we have a little, um, I think Jim had wanted to ask a question about what is an example that you've seen that worked 
that was good? And what did it take to make that happen? And are we not there yet? Um, I don't think we're there yet. I will give one example that I think has, has worked really well. And we all know that um, we, well, we still have the issue, but there is a, one of the solutions that's out there that's, that's making some progress. And that is the maternal and infant morbidity uh, rate that where black women have the highest rates, the most deaths of uh, the mom and or the baby than any other population. And it doesn't matter about the, the black woman's socioeconomic status, her education, her geography, uh, none of that. Um, it still is the highest. And so, and I know some of you know my, my own story. My first child died of a crib death at two months old, my first daughter, my second daughter and I both almost died from placenta privia coming in, in at one of the top premier uh, Prentice Women's Hospital at Northwestern University and just neglect. I was in the room hemorrhaging and my husband and I didn't know. They said, oh, it's common uh, to have some bleeding when you go into labor. And then nobody ever came back and checked. And when a nurse finally wandered in, say, oh, I just want to see how far you're dilated and she um, pulled back the cover and she didn't have a good poker face. She, her eyes got big as dimes and she's out, we'll be back. Well, she came back with most of the floor to rush me into ER and have the, um, you know, have the cesarean and I'd lost so much blood. I had to have a blood transfusion. My the baby was jaundiced. It was a horrible thing. So I have lived it personally. So I definitely pay attention to that. And one of the programs that Stanford created um, which is actually a very good program. They're having a lot of difficulty getting the community organizations to uh, support it as much because of the lack of trust. However, uh, because they do have the power, they have created this um, California Maternal Quality um, Care uh, Quality Care Coalition, and that organization has put together uh, some really amazing work they've created. Um, for example, a, um, a, a, first of all, they're mandating that all the public hospitals and the district hospitals um, are members and participate in this collaboration, this collaborative. But they also have created these wonderful tools, like they have an OB hemorrhage uh, toolkit that these hospitals are, are um, able to use. And they are seeing some tremendous results with this, the uh, death rate from women hemorrhaging during um, in childbirth has gone down 20% at those collaboration hospitals and the ones that uh, previously that have been doing it for a significant time, uh, their rate has gone down to 28.6%. But doing that kind of work where they are preparing the hospitals in advance, they've done the research, they're telling them what are the signs, what to look out for and doing the education um, with the hospitals now, they need the education with the with the parents, and there are some great programs that are doing that. Because if I would have had the education uh, to know uh, that this was not normal, I would hopefully I would have yelled and said something, and somebody would have paid attention to me. So it's a joint effort, and the, it's a very successful program. And that's one example. If we can get programs like that moving forward more, we can help reduce. Uh, that rate of maternal and infant uh, morbidity. I think another uh, example, um, Mary, is um, an interesting uh, phenomenon where, where, again, looking at what makes sense for business and therefore, and having business uh, align with, with good, good, good uh, practices. As we move to the era of value-based reimbursement in healthcare delivery, where there now is, and away from fee-for-service reimbursement, there now becomes a significant financial incentive for providers of care uh, to be able to move upstream to some of the precursors of, 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 of illness, identifying people before they become ill and then doing things necessary to put wraparound services so that they don't fall into illness. So that therefore doesn't affect negatively the financial bottom line. What that has led to is this recognition of not only the social determinants of health, but the recognition of the need to address them. So now we're seeing major health organizations buying housing, uh, being in the housing supply business, being in the food supply business, so that we're beginning to see a reformulation of the business model of major uh, healthcare practices. So they start to now being able to say, look, it is in my incentive 
financially to be investing in some of these other elements. So you see companies like United Health Group and other insurers who are, especially those in the Medicaid space, who are now spending capital in providing access to some of these things uh, in partnership for their patients. I think what we're starting to now do is to harmonize rational economic incentives with intelligent public policy to solve fundamental issues. Just an eye on time. I did want to um, say to our listening audience, you know, I think we would all like you to come back very soon and we could go on for a much longer. And I think there's so much more to dive into that we can learn from your experience. If, if people who are watching this are um, inspired, that's terrific. You should also be mad. I think that's a very natural response and that should spur you to think about how we can make more change in the healthcare industry. For each of our panelists, could you share the one key takeaway you would give to, you know, you have healthcare listening, what would you say to them? Um, Dr. Isom, do you want to start? Yeah, I appreciate uh, earlier Dr. Tuxin's articulation of how much we've invested in white um, wealth, white health, and white well-being. And you have to think about turning the tides on racial disparities in health and health care as a similar form of investment. So investing in the pipeline, that could be very concretely looking at the Student National Medical Association, which does pipeline work. These are students who are mostly black actually doing pipeline work that should be done by the white institutions, right? Investing dollars and also time. Um, there should also be investments in making sure people make it uh, through medical school and through residency training and beyond by adapting even like discrimination policies within hospitals. Um, a lot of people experience trauma, racial trauma throughout their journey to even become a physician. Um, there's also the racial trauma of interacting with the healthcare system that doesn't treat you well. And I want to name for uh, Mary Stutz, that was a traumatic experience for you um, that will shape how you subsequently interact with the healthcare system. So investing across the entire continuum is, is the point. That is the solution in the same way that we have invested in white lives and livelihoods and health and well-being since this country was founded. Thank you. Uh, Mary? Yes, please let me go before we... <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, <laughs> I will say though, for me, as you know, I, my focus is really on health equity and especially community health equity. So for me, the biggest thing that organizations can do is to form those partnerships and make the investment, think out of the box, not just a conversation here or there, but bring all forms of partnership, including funding and people and investment and be open to hearing their ideas and their thoughts and um, understand the voices that need to make the case for improving the situation. It may not always be your voice. Boy, I, I tell you, I just love to build on Dr. Isom and, and Mary's points. I, I will tell you that the hardest work that we've been doing uh, in trying to get the Black community to be engaged in health, self-health enhancing behaviors has been and, and through this pandemic has been not having black faces to be able to point to in positions of authority and control. So we've had to desperately find people everywhere we can in NIH, um, you know, and using the same three suspects over and over and over again, putting their faces out there as saying, look, black community, see there are black folks involved in the process and we had to find them. I chaired for the, uh, for the, for, for the head of NIH, uh, Dr. Francis Collins, a special committee on why was it that we were not finding uh, enough African-Americans and other people of color getting R01 grants, the premier grants for NIH. And, and so they're trying to dedicate being able to, to do that. And so we have a lot of work to do. But what I will ultimately say for the work that WTO is doing is that in all of your clients and the people you're working with, we've got to continue to urge them to hire people of color, not because of some abstract uh, 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 affirmative action program that sort of lets people in, no, it's because we need the intelligence of the Black community. That's what NIH needed. That's why Francis Collins wanted that. You cannot have a robust uh, uh, federal uh, research enterprise that does not take into account the specific expertise of Dr. Isom. If you don't have her voice there starting to lay out the research agenda, we're going to be missing things. And so I want to say to W2O that one of the things I really like about you is not only do you care, not only are you paying attention, not only do you respect, but also you have people of color that are working. So, you know, we benefit from, from Jewel Jones. Uh, Jewel has been terrific. Jewel knows stuff. She represents you all so well, but she brings not only a competence at her job, 
She brings the connectivity uh, to us. She knows what we're trying to say. And so I'm, I'm looking at the way you all form teams around each other and how you explore multicultural perspectives. That's what we need more of. And you've got to have multicultural people at the table with, uh, with an insight into how people think, as opposed to some of these other firms that we are running into who are trying to, every time they want to spend three weeks testing, oh, you know, test this, test that, test this. While people are dying like flies, other people are running around, well, we can't go forward yet because we don't know what we're talking about. So we got to test our messages and figure out how do we learn what we need to do on the fly. WTO didn't have to do that. They came in with us and started running full speed day one. That's what we need to do. Thank you. And just for people um, in the audience, diversity has been shown to foster innovation, right? You need different uh, perspectives to do better and to think of new ideas. There's a lot of scientific data on that. It's not about being nice. It's not about being fair. It's about actually what is good for your business as well. Marcy, I'm going to turn it over for you. I apologize. I ran over, uh, which I hoped not to do, but... This was such an amazing conversation. I don't know if you can see the chat comments. My screen is lighting up and people are really so appreciative of everything that you've done. Um, thank and we hope you're, you're back very soon. Maybe tomorrow, you know, we can meet on a Saturday and do it again. Well, thank you so much, Mary. Thank you so much, Dr. Tuxon. Oh my God, such great nuggets. Um, I don't know how much more I can add to what you've said because you have been amazing. Dr. Isom, Mary, the two Marys, thank you. <laughs> you know, um, I must, I have to say that this was an idea that Mary had when I just started in December. And I know she said something to Jim and Jim pulled me in and she and I had a discussion and I'm like, let's connect with Wendy. And then the next thing you know, here we are. This was really amazing. Thank you all for your uh, wisdom. Dr. Tuxon, thank you for the history. Dr. Issam, thank you for the work that you're doing in the community. You touched on so many great points. My husband went back to um, medical school at an old age and oh my God, he is still trying to get into residency. So, you know, and some of the, the experience you had, Mary, was similar to what I had when I had my son. But, you know, these are stories that we need to tell. And we just know that um, here, at, and I'm just so appreciative that here at W2O, we are open to learning and hearing. So thank you. You know, we must account for the history. We really must. And I know that we have one question so I'm going to try and get to that quickly. And it, is, it says, what advice would you give to those of us who have friends in their 20s who don't want to get the vaccine because they think the vaccine is more dangerous than COVID to them? Well, just run the numbers. Uh... <laughs> Uh, we're at 430,000 headed to 130,000 deaths in the next three weeks without a vaccine. And to our knowledge today, no one has died from the uh, COVID vaccine. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I mean, how much, how much more do you need to say? Okay, got it. So are there any other questions so far? I've only seen one and I know that um, I'm looking in the chat. Well, if there are no other questions, um, let me again say thank you all so much. Um, you know, I want to thank our colleagues who worked behind the scene to make this happen. Wendy and her team, Tom, um, Jewel Jones. I know we spoke to Eric Roberts as well. Thank you all so much to our amazing business resource groups. I know that the fusion groups are planning some amazing initiatives for Black History Month, which I'll tell you more about. And I also wanna thank my amazing team, Carla and Tony, who like myself, have only been here for two months. And I know that they are, they rock. They're doing great work and they rock. And wanted to tell you about what's coming up um, in the next week, in the next couple of weeks and next month. So, 
Thank you all for joining. Thank you to all the colleagues who came in from across the long hallway. Um, I saw folks from the UK joining in. Thank you for joining us in this remarkable conversation. I hope that this has inspired many of you to be part of the solutions and to use the education that we got today to counsel our clients, our colleagues, and our communities. So some of the updates that I'd like to share is that um, a new client offering from the value and access team and our DEI client engagement team, W2O's first health equity news feature launches today. Health equity, health equity digest, I'm excited I can't speak. <laughs> This feature provides culturally relevant insights and education on the intersection between health equity and the access environment and highlights our subject matter expertise and analytics capabilities. It will curate the best stories from media, summaries from academic journals, track leg legislation, spotlight on progress being made in the fight for health equity, and showcase emerging leaders and voices in this space. We'll be rolling out this feature once a month as part of the weekly value report. So please share with your teams and your clients. And for Black History Month, there's some great initiatives coming your way. And it includes a series of social posts celebrating Black doctors, scientists and leaders instrumental in the development of the COVID vaccine and our voices for health equity. There, there's also going to be a virtual book club. And this book is going to be cast, The Origin of Our Discontents by Isabel Wilkerson. And I would advise everyone to read this book. Uh, it, is in, it is in our Amazon business store, so you're able to use it. Um, you can purchase it from your stipend and look for a post from Fusion on, on HAPS on how to sign up. There will also be a special video featuring our fellow colleagues <coughs> soon to come where we discuss the importance of honoring Black History Month. In addition, Yesterday, we launched our Lean in Circles, which is sponsored by Jen Gottlieb, our president, and was led by Carrie Galley. It was amazing. We've gotten such amazing feedback. So if you missed it, the recording has been posted in Workplace, where you can find more information and sign up to participate as a leader of a circle or to participate in a circle. Um, in addition to that, um, I want you to know that we are going to have a very important survey. And I know that some of you may say oh, another survey, but this one is going to be our annual inclusion survey. And this is where we're going to measure our progress with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this is where we're going to hear from you. We need to hear your voice. We need, you know, this is about all of us. Um, building an inclusive work environment, you know. Um, and when we hear from you, we'll know how to progress. We'll know what we need to focus on. We'll know what we need to prioritize. So this is gonna be rolled out in early March. So please be on the lookout and please um, participate. We're also gonna be celebrating Women's History Month in March. And we're gonna be having a special celebration, and this one is very dear to my heart. This is going to be an event that is going to be coming to us from the London office for International Women's Day, which is going to be celebrated on March 8th. So on March 8th at 4 p.m. our time, um, we will be hearing from a woman who is dubbed as the force for change. She has sm smashed the glass ceiling of the Church of England or the Anglican Church. So I know that many of you are fans of the crown, right? And that you may have watched the wedding of Meghan and Harry, and you saw Bishop Rose, um, she prayed for the couple. So Bishop Rose, she was the chaplain to the Queen of England for many years. She was also the chaplain to the House of Commons. And in 2019, 
she was elevated as the first black bishop, black female bishop for the Church of England. So she is going to be talking to Annalise Scotty, who is the group president for W2O in London. So please save the date and time on your calendar. You will not want to miss That's this. That's cool. That's really cool. And I must say that, that Reverend Rose, Reverend Rose is a friend and a neighbor. We went to the same high school. So I was there to see her elevated in 2019. In, um, that's so in cool. It's great. That we should tape. That we really should really. That's amazing. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. So stay tuned to more amazing events from the DEI team and from Fusion and the rest of our BRGs. We <clears> are making this happen. We are family. We are resilient. And we are working together to build a healthier world. I'm gonna pass it on to Jim, who's on camera. Well, I, yeah, so I, you know, of course, whenever this happens, they they start blowing the leaves, you know, and I'm like, why is there such a thing as a leaf blower? What is that? I used to have to rake, I don't understand. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, you You all were great to the doctors, to Mary, to the to, well, Mary's a, Mary Seidman's a doctor, so you're in the doctor group. Um, thank you so much for doing this, uh, Marcia, for leading us. I mean, you don't get to talk good things about yourself, right? But look, we're only as good as the leader. Uh, keep up the great work, and let's let's keep keep this momentum. I think you made a great point. Let's take this to our clients. We have a powerful group of clients. That, that really do need to step up big. Our biggest client, Ken Frazier, retired this week. You know, how are we gonna work with him going forward, in, you know, in his next and new role? I've heard different things about what he's gonna do, um, but we wanna, of course, be behind him 100%. Um, we work closely with lots of other groups and let's just keep this momentum up and especially taking this particular conversation can be brought to our clients easily, readily, uh, I think impactfully and to media. You know, I, like Dr. Texan said, he knows with me, you know, it's not a lot of permission here. You know, asking permission is just one more step. I think just letting us know is a good thing. I mean, Mary knows she's laughing, um, but, I think letting us know so we're aware the efforts are going on, but for the most part, you know, a good idea doesn't happen unless you just get it, get her done. So uh, that's what it's really all about at this point. Uh, we, and no fear. I mean, you know, you look at the guy they poisoned in Russia is now sitting in a jail cell. He's willing to go back and sit in a jail cell for it. At this point, you know, I think we're in a really, Un, like unprecedented time for any of us in our lifetime. So you just got to be willing to go up and face this nation and hit it on the head. And it's time. And if we, I've been doing it, Mary's been doing it. These doctors have been doing it. Um, it's never been more important. So, um, you know, you have my hundred percent support. Marcia, keep leading us, educating us. You know, you have my full support in doing so. So everybody have a great weekend and, uh, you know, you East Coasters are getting all our snow. So enjoy that. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you so Jim. much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have See a wonderful all. weekend. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.